how are you? Happy New Year. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, Kat Covell. Hey, Will Murphy. Happy New Year to you. That's great. That's great. All right. I guess you know we had to uh, accidentally postpone this one, so it's kind of exciting. We start the new year with a little overview of uh, VPU, uh, a very fantastic component of the uh, Grand MA2 system. Um, so just to give you a rundown of what this webinar will kind of be like today, um, I might be talking a little bit more. Uh, to give you the overview of the VPU to help you understand the philosophy and some of the, just the basic setup, how easy it is to, to get it into your system. Um, just like the OnPC software, you know, there's uh, not the OnPC, just like the Grand MA2 software, uh, I use OnPC in these webinars. You know, we've done a ton of webinars this year. There's still plenty more to learn about OnPC. It's a, it's a growth process. Uh, I can't show you everything about VPU in just one webinar. So today is going to be just how it plugs into the system, how you get it into your session, how you patch it. And then a, a common request now is, is related to how the, the pixel mapper works. So for today, you're actually not going to see any of the VPU GUI uh, because really you don't have to touch the VPU hardware itself because it's designed to be managed from the console. There are a few things that the GUI can help with and we'll cover that GUI in a future webinar. Does that sound good, Kat? Sounds like a plan, Will. All right, let's try to get started. So I'm going to flip-flop here between my camera so you can look at my face and my screen sharing uh, as needed. So we'll just start with uh, the basic MA2 system philosophy actually help you understand uh, how the VPU ties into this system. So if you happen to join us for LDI this year, you probably saw these, this document on our network table, which gives you the general idea of how a Grand MA2 system might look like. And you'll notice in the middle, you have the VPU light, for example. Um, there also exists the VPU Plus, which is the most uh, has the highest processing power, whereas the VPU light is the lowest. There is a VPU basic, which is kind of middle of the road processing. Um, when we speak of processing, we're talking about performance. How many how how many HD clips can simultaneously be rendered? Um, previous, you know, prior to version 3.2, we only used the MPEG-2 codec. And that was a constant bit rate, so it was easy for us to measure performance. We talked about it in terms of the VPU Plus doing uh, six simultaneous HD layers. With the new HAP codec, that number is a lot higher, higher. But HAP codec has three different uh, uh, compression options, and which one you choose dictates performance and quality of the actual clip. And it also uses variable bit rate, so it's a little harder to give you an exact number of simultaneous clips because it's very content dependent. However, I do know for certain uh, it's many more than six clips. So VPU Lite can, with the HAP codec can definitely process multiple HD clips simultaneously. Um, if you're looking for, you know, information about the differences in the hardware, you can always go to acclighting.com, go to the products pages, and you'll find uh, MA video, which is VPU Lite, VPU Plus, MK2. So for example, uh, if you look at the back panel, the VPU Plus has three DVI outputs. Two of those are dual link, which means they'll work with X-Force and uh, EDID, sorry, not EDI, uh, Triple head, triple head is the, is the name I'm thinking of. If we take a look at the VPU light, uh, this back panel is going to be two DVI ports. One of those is a dual link uh, DVI port, so you can hook up a triple head or a double head or an X4. Uh, you'll notice you have audio output on all three VPUs, which are XLR left and right, so you can have audio in your files or you can play WAV, WAV files or MP3 files. USB ports. Uh, as you would expect for content management and the, the uh, two Ethernet ports. So P Ethernet port one would be 
MANET, Ethernet port 2, would be for FACN or ARTNET uh, pixel mapping. So that's where you can go read more about the, the actual hardware and some performance uh, specs. So in terms of speaking about how this fits into the system, uh, we're looking at this, this network guide. Um, I actually can upload this guide to you guys. I think it's going to upload. Yeah, there it is. So you find that in the handout section of your uh, GoToWebinar software. And here's the bit that you have to understand. Um, Kat, you can see, can you see my mouse on the screen? Uh, I have a Over the console? I don't remember. Yes, I can see it. It is mouse. visible. Yes. Yeah. So the mouse clicks are visible. So you might start with a Grand MA2 Lite, for example. And if you need DMX ports somewhere in your system, we're going to talk about the philosophy of the VPU. How does this fit into the bigger structure? If you have a Grand MA2 Lite and you want DMX ports in your system, you go over here, you're going to add nodes, 8-port node, 4-port node, 2-port node. If you've ever used an MA node, there is no management at the node. You do all the management from the console. But the decision that you're making here is that you realize you need DMX ports somewhere in your arena or your building, et cetera, so you add a node. Um, in terms of system philosophy, if you're granted made too light, which is 4,096 parameters, which is roughly eight universes, if you need more processing power, you need 16 universes, you have a 24 universe show, et cetera, you're going to add an MPU. And you probably notice an MPU. You don't actually do anything at the MPU. You plug it into the network. It becomes a processing member of the Grand MA2 system, which is all synchronized via Ethernet. Furthermore, if you need a backup, you can add another console. You can add a replay unit. These all connect via Ethernet. So why might you choose to add a VPU to this system? Same philosophy. It's a component of the system. The VPUs are not standalone media servers. They are P a component of the Grand MA2 system, whereas the control surface is the actual MA2 software. But they don't have DMX ports, right? What do they have? Video ports. So if you decide that you need video ports somewhere in your show, you have a screen on stage left or center or upstage, et cetera, and you want a DVI port there, now the lighting guy knows how to add a DVI port to output some video. And each VPU that you add doesn't become a separate media server entity. It just becomes another device in the system in the same way that over here on this guide we have four nodes. Yeah, those are four physical products, but to the Grand MA2 system, they're just DMX ports, and you tell those ports what universes they should output. These two VPUs while physically they are two different boxes, from a control standpoint, they're just DVI ports, and you choose what video goes out of those ports. So you have to understand that part of the, the VPU is that it's a component of the Grand MA2 system, whereas the Grand MA2 software becomes the control for that actual device. Another little thing I like to share with people, if you look closely, the VPU stands for Video Processing Unit. We don't necessarily call it a media server. So it is very hard to directly compare it to some of the media servers on the market, such as Hippo or D3 or AI, Pandora. Those are dedicated you know, media server companies that do very, say, complex video type of control projects. Whereas VPU is a little different. It's a video processing unit for the Grand MA2 system, which is really catered towards the lighting guy because the control comes from the actual MA2 software. So therefore, that means it's a lot easier to set up. We also have a fantastic pixel mapper built in. So you've probably used, maybe you've used pixel mapping from other media servers. You have to, you know, basically double up the patch, do a bunch of work on that other device. Since the VPU is actually part of our system, it already knows all the information. That's kind of what we're going to look at today. Um, do you know, Kat, if any quick questions popped up in my explanation? Or if I can keep going? You actually just answered a whole lot of questions. I'm kind of checking them off the list here. So uh, That's good. The main question is, 
what is the VPU in this system. So please continue. Yeah. So we're going to go through the setup process now. I have a VPU light in the room here with me, and it's plugged into my network. And I have a blank show file. I, start, I started a new show, um, just so you guys can see. I'll start a new show. <laughs> um, if you've ever used a node or an NPU, in order to communicate with those devices, you have to have a session running. So I'm going to start a session. Now I actually have a session running. This is my master. And then in MANet control where you add consoles, NPUs, 3D, there's a VPU tab, which is just for the MA VPU products. We'll add present, and you'll see my VPU light is actually detected. First thing you would do is you'd want to make it part of your session, just like you would with an MPU. Now, you have no control of VPU yet because you haven't actually patched it. But we actually we can get to the settings. So if I edit this, you'll see where I can set the resolution of the outputs on the VPU. All right, the goal here is kind of remote management of your VPU, and you can set the video card that's associated with that output. Um, this becomes useful in case you did some programming at home and you get the real VPU and you have to flip-flop the video cards because of where your soft edging was set up. Additional settings, I mean, most of these are outlined in the help manual if we missed one and you're based in North America, you can email support at acolyting.com or contact your local distributor if you're outside North America. And we have the render settings, whether we're rendering DVI, pixel map, or, or both. Uh, you also get access to your global v VPU settings, which is for the whole <clears throat> kind of VPU system, clip time format, the thumbnails. Um, yes, you get thumbnails in the console. This happens automatically. It uses a proprietary format not CITP, and therefore you get smaller thumbnails. But in order to do something, we have to patch this VPU. So this common question, uh, how do you patch a VPU? Call it whatever you want, just to prove to you that the name of your layer doesn't matter. You just have to have a layer in your patch that's dedicated to your VPU system. We'll go to the library. I'm going to I was testing this out earlier, but the manufacturer is obviously MA Lighting. The fixture is going to be BPU. We start with video layers. This is what's actually playing the video, and that's a flat plane object, or it's a 3D object like a sphere or some other object that's in this 3D and spatial environment of video processing land. So, number of layers. Uh, if you have a, if you're using both outputs on the on the VPU and you want both of those to be different videos, you're obviously going to need a minimum of two layers. Um, if you're going to be crossfading from layers, you're going to need more than that. If you're using Pixel Mapper, you might need more layers. A really neat fact of the VPU is that we don't actually limit the number of layers you can patch. Because why do we care? A layer is just an item in a database. What that layer is doing is what takes all the performance. So if you patch 100 layers and you try to process 100 layers of different 1080p clips, it's definitely not going to work. But if you patch, I don't know, 20 layers and they're all pictures, those are just pictures. They don't really take much processing, so the VPU is going to work fine. Um, so it's up to you. You decide how many layers you want. I guess I will patch five in this case. I'm um, just going to name these fixture ID, channel ID 101, uh, one. and here's a really neat fact. Patch address doesn't matter. Do whatever you want. It also doesn't cost you any parameters. I'm controlling this VPU from on PC. I don't have an on PC wing. I don't have any parameters in my on PC right now. I don't have a node. I get to control the VPU for free because it's an MA product. And the patch address doesn't matter, so you don't have to screw around with patch addresses. I added it to our session, so the MA system automatically figures out how those numbers line up. Next item you have to patch is a camera. Um, here's where I will ugh, I jump back to the beginning. 
turn my camera back on, I just want to explain a little bit about the camera and the layer. So there's this 3D environment. It's just kind of, there's, there's a limit of something, but it's, these objects are around. So all your layers are here. These can be spheres, these can be triangles, pyramids, etc. And then you have these cameras over here. The cameras are looking at these objects. All right, and then this camera processes what it sees and it sends it somewhere. You, in your VPU settings, will decide whether the camera links to a pixel mapper or to a real DVI port on the output of the VPU or does even more fancy stuff called virtual cameras. So, to jump back to setting this up, um, I know that I have two DVI ports on my VPU light. If those are going to be doing different things, I'm going to ha need two cameras. If they're going to do the same thing, I just need one camera and I'll link it to both those outputs. And if I'm going to do pixel mapping and DVI output separately, I need three cameras. For today's example, I'm just going to patch two cameras. Uh, we'll put those at ID 11 and 12. Once again, patch address doesn't matter. It just needs to be in there. And with any VPU system, you always need one master channel, which is sort of control. You know, shut down your VPU, turn it on, put it into show mode, take it out of show mode, things like that. You just always need one. So you see I have my five layers, uh, my two cameras, and a master that needs to be there. Okay. Now we have to go back to the MANet configuration because this VPU that's in my session doesn't know what patch layer it's listening to. See how it's set to none? I need to set that to the name of the layer, which here I proved to you, you can name the layer whatever you want. And now the VPU is associated with that layer. So this particular VPU is listening to the uh, video layer, camera, and master fixture that's in that uh, patch layer of your grand MA2. Your patching is done. You're done. You have full control of your VPU at this point. Um, so how might you control this thing? Well, I have a tendency, I like to start with auto create. I create single groups for all the layers and the cameras of my VPU so that I have a way to select the actual fixtures. Um, So we have the three layers and two cameras. So dealing with your, like controlling your VPU is going to be easier from the smart window. So I'm going to start with a groups view here. And I just like to differentiate these a little bit. Give them a little space so I can see my two cameras, my layers. Um, then we need a smart window because a lot of the times with the VPU, you're just kind of picking the stuff that you want. So the way the actual control works is that you grab a layer, bring it to full. Nope, I got move stuck in the command line. Grab a layer, bring it to full. You're going to get white output fed to that camera. Now, remember I said, where does that camera link to? This is where these edit settings again, uh, this is where these settings are useful. So camera one is associated with DVI port one, camera two is associated with DVI port two. You can change that around as you want because you can have multiple cameras. The, the, we uh, by default support 16 cameras. So I say, you know, virtually unlimited number of layers, we by default support 16 cameras. Uh, the dimmer is at full. Everything else you find under video, so we go to iPool, we pick a folder, this iPool object associated with a folder. Every VPU is going to have a standard folder, and you're going to pick content. Now, I just need to uh, update the thumbs. So you see if I go to just a different pool object right now, we'd see all the thumbnails didn't come over yet. Ah, there they are. Here's some thumbnails. Um, this is stuff that you end up triggering from the actual the actual VPU GUI, which, like I said, we'll cover in a in a future webinar. Um, 
But this is the pool. This is the actual images. That, this is actual the image or video files that are in the folder itself. And then you have a whole slew of other kind of server settings that you would expect. Uh, you know, moving the layer, rotating it. Oh, back on V object, we can actually select 3D objects, whether it's a box, a cone, a sphere. Um, you have continuous position, continuous rotation, scaling, image, splitting the image, offsetting the image, uh, scrolling the image. This is all the stuff to really show you this stuff. I have to use the VPU GUI, which, like I said, we'll cover in a future webinar. But this overview is just to give you an idea of the VPU that exists, how to connect it. This software is free. You can download it, uh, run it on your Windows computer. Um, you're not going to be able to output DVI for free. It does get a, it does have a watermark unless you use the teaser mode, which is two layers, one camera, and content that's 800 by 600. So you could start using this little VPU from your Windows computer just to get used to the software. You got four effects channels per layer, uh, borders. You choose the camera that's visible to the VPU, which is a whole another explanation to go over. But remember, I'm just doing an overview right now to give you a basic idea. And I don't understand why my thumbnails aren't updating. But, but while you're on that, um, there was a question about being able to use um, on PC and the free software on, on the same computer. Can you? Yeah. Well, it gets a little tougher when you try to run them on the same computer because the VPU software is designed to, um, <clears throat> it has a shell that overtakes your Granime 2. That's it. Let me rephrase that. It has a shell that covers up your Windows OS UI because that same where you normally see your Windows UI is the same output that's being used to actually output video to projector or monitor or whatever. So normally you want to dedicate a machine to the VPU software and have a different machine for control purposes. Um, we do have streaming CITP. Let me double check if this works. I may have forgotten to unblock my firewall. But if we jump here, we need to enable CITP, just so the VPU knows that. And we'll start that. And we see the VPU here. Sometimes, oh yeah, that's good. Let's see if we get actual video output on the screen. Here we go. So this is an actual output from the VPU itself. Um, just shrinking this down. Let's give you a chance to see some of the stuff. So this is low res, you know. CITP streaming into the console is going to be low res. This video is actually a 1080p video. Uh, but it's a way that you can preview all your layers right from the console so you don't even have to use any kind of VPU preview software. And you'll see some of the thumbnails are here. It does take a little time since I just connected the VPU. I think the thumbnails are just taking a little time to get here because it intermixes updating thumbnails in between what you're actually doing. Okay. I think that's the general idea of the VPU. Yeah. Right? That's a very good general uh, overview. Yeah. Um, so. There are two other, like, really general questions I'm seeing, though, which is, you know, how you hook up projectors, and then how do you interface an external camera or capture device? Those sound like they're general system questions to me. So hooking up a projector is via the DVI ports on the back of the VPUs. I pointed this out here. There's two. There's two DVI ports on the VPU light. Uh, there's three on the basic and the plus. Uh, if you're trying to do video input, uh, you'll do that via the HDFDI ports. That's only an option on the VPU plus and basic. Remember, it's optional. You have to buy the basic or the plus from the factory with those ports installed. So if you're planning to use HDSDI input, there's two of them. If you're going to a rental company, make sure you specify that it's the VPU with HDSDI. 
because if people, that obviously costs a little more. Um, a little nice statistic, our input latency is about as low as you can possibly get, uh, at a, which is 1.5 frames of delay at 60 frames per second. So very low latency. It's almost just one frame, but a little bit, half, half of another frame. Um, but there are people that use VPUs that don't need input, so they didn't buy the VPU with the HDSDI input. Uh, the VPU light does not have an input card, so keep that in mind. I think those are the those are the two questions, right? Uh, yeah, there's another one um, about cameras. I mean, I know you told me this is a, a fairly difficult one to wrap your head around, but can you do a little bit um, more explanation of the camera and does it set perspectives for projection mapping? Is that is that the purpose of the camera? The camera. Once again, you got to understand is in this 3D space, right? In the VPU environment, in this virtual world, there are objects. I think I could show this actually. If we go to this object and we choose a box and I set it to rotate, that's very slow. So you have this 3D object, which is a box in this case, which is rotating. That's in this 3D world. It's blah, 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 blah. all right. Now, why do I see that on my output? Because there's a camera over here, and the camera sees that box rotating. The camera processes what it sees, and then it goes out somewhere. It either gets fed to the DVI port, or it gets fed to the pixel mapper. In your VPU settings is where you're setting this up. So if camera one is what's looking at that box and camera one is linked to DVI port one, now you actually see that outputted on the screen, which is mimicked here in this viewer window. Cool. Okay. So you have to remember all 16, well, we only patched two. So there's two of them here. They're, they're virtually on top of each other. All 16 would be here unless you move this camera around. Now moving the camera around, maybe you would move the camera with a multi-projector blend, but in the VPU system, you wouldn't actually do that. We would use this camera split function. But the concept to get your brain around it is, yeah, okay, you're moving the cameras to change perspectives of how they look at the box. Um, I actually do that if I grab camera one there is camera position, and now it's that side, now it's that way. So I'm moving the actual camera as opposed to moving the layer. Or if I go back and grab the layer, now I'm moving the layer back and forth, which I could use the encoder, but in order for you to see this, I can't get to my encoder at the moment. Thumbs up. Yeah? Yeah, that's good. Um. So the other common question we're seeing a lot is, you know, related to Pixel Mapper. So I just want to show you an overview of how to set up the Pixel Mapper. That'll probably take us to the end. But let's just say we have 100 LEDs. So I'm going to go here and patch some generic RGB, 8-bit LEDs. Uh, I forgot something. I can't show you this today because I don't have any parameters. <laughs> My mistake. I'll show you the setup. I just can't show you show it in action. But we'll have 100 LEDs. Um, there will be more EPU webinars, so definitely stay tuned. Uh, if we select all those LEDs, set up wizard. Uh, point five ten by ten. I close there. Move it back. Maybe these are maybe this array is upstage a little bit. Whoa. Oh, 
So now I set up my stage view. Now what I will do, beautiful thing, go to the VPU pixel mapper, we'll add an area. Areas can either be dimensionally accurate if you are doing, for example, an, a curtain upstage and you want to have dimensionally accurate pixel mapping, or you could just, you know, I just want to put some content on my LEDs. I don't really care about the real world dimensions. So then I'm going to choose dimensions that are based off of my content, 16 by 9, and, which is 16 by 9. So I'm going to say 16 meters by 9 meters because that's HD content, which is 16 by 9. Uh, you specify a render IP of the actual VPU that's processing the pixel map data. Remember I said you could have multiple VPUs. Maybe you have one VPU that's being used for pixel map calculation and two other VPUs are actually doing the DVI output. Now a single VPU can do both. Uh, but if a VPU light can only process 127 universes of pixel mapping. So if the VPU is doing all that pixel mapping, I probably wouldn't use it for DVI output. But if I'm doing like 10 universes of pixel mapping and I have one video wall, it would probably be fine. There's no way to give you concrete answers about what can and can't work. You have to learn from experience. You got to test it out. I wish it was a little easier way, but that's video for you. Um, the quality of your pixel mapping, if you have really high res, low spaces between your LEDs, then yeah, increase this resolution. But for my setup here, it's only 100 pixels. I'm just going to do a resolution of 100 by 100 to not overtax the VPU for no reason. The protocol, we're going to use MANET2 because it's going to get routed back through the system, so you don't even have to think about ARTNET or SACN in this case. Just plug your LEDs into your MA nodes, and it's going to work. The VPU already knows the patch addresses of these things because they're in your GRANMA2 patch. So now we're going to zoom to fit, and then... My LEDs are selected, so I'm going to store them to my pixel map area. I mean, I can align them automatically, or I'm going to use the 3D, com 3D coordinates. So X axis in the stage view is left to right. Z axis is floor to ceiling, so this axis is correct. And now it already knows where this stuff is located. I go to setup. I will drag those in the middle of the pixel mapper. And now the VPU pixel mapper is set up. If you've ever tried to pixel map, do a pixel map setup on any other server, I guess you would say it would take a lot longer. <laughs> okay, this is what's magical about the VPU integration. Your pixel map's all set up, it's ready to go. It's pixel mapping right now. And one thing I need to do is I do need to enable the pixel mapper which I didn't have on before, so I'm going to render pixel map here as well. So now the VPU is actually outputting that pixel map data, which I can confirm at my VPU. Um, the downside, unfortunately, I f can't remember if I can do this without the parameters in the console or not. I'm drawing a blank. And Mr. Ryan Kanarek is asking if you could check no parameter and then merge it back in via ArtNet. Right now? Yeah. No, actually, I think this works. Because, okay. yeah, this does work because I have a real VPU. I remember now. Um, I think, no? I have done these tests. Now my brain is uh, not helping me right now. Um, B, yeah, I mean, right now if I wanted to set up ArtNet and SACN, but then I have to use the second port, so that's not going to work out so well. So Ryan's question is, Ryan's getting all complicated on <laughs> Freaking guy. He's typing furiously. Oh, yeah. He's going to remind me how to do this. You have to use no parameters for the VPU to calculate it. No, I think. It is calculating it. It's already calculating it. The issue is that the GRANMA2 doesn't want to process it because I don't have any parameters. But at the same time, my brain is telling me I'm wrong. So you see, for the audience that's listening, 
We can't remember everything. There's a thousand things to remember. Um, but we'll catch you up. We'll catch this in a future webinar. But what I can tell you is this is the setup process. So if you plan to use pixel mapping, you can do that. Now I'll tell you another caveat. Remember I said that the the VPU software is free, right? So if you actually have a real console and you have control of all these pixels, you can pixel map for free because we're not double charging you for parameters. If you've already unlocked parameters and you have control of the pixels on stage, you can utilize the VPU for pixel mapping. Now you probably learned in 3.2, we also, we also implemented bitmap fixtures in the console, which is a webinar that's available on our YouTube channel already. That's for low res kind of pixel mapping, just cool stuff, cool effects, etc. If you want to get really complicated with your pixel mapping, you want to have 3D objects and rotating and add all these effects on top of this stuff, um, then you might add a VPU to your system. Now you can do this for free if you build your own Windows computer. Up to a certain extent, I'm sure it's going to be fine. But if you really want that dedicated hardware that you know is solid and tested by MA, it's going to work and we can fully support you on it, you know, go rent a VPU light. If you're going to do a lot of pixel mapping, like 256 universes, um, you'd get a VPU basic or plus. I'm not sure if you just answered the question. Uh, someone just asked, uh, how many pixel mappers can be used at the same time? Is there a limit to how much you can pixel map? I think well, you're, that. Yeah, you're going to be limited by the number of universes, but if, just to clarify, if you're asking about this, I can keep adding more outputs to that single area, and this could be number two, camera two, and then this could be, oops, this could be camera three, and this can be camera four. What's really neat is each output can be the same fixtures, or it can be in a different arrangement, or it can be different fixtures. And because it's each camera, you now have the ability to do different videos on each output. You also, if you have different size areas, you can add a second area and add more outputs to that as well. So you get a whole lot of versatility. There is some kind of limit here because, you know, everything has a limit, but I really don't think you'll hit it. If you do, give us a call and we'll see if we can increase it. <laughs> cool. Cool. Ready for more questions? We'll certainly try. Or do you still got things on your mind there, Will? I always have lots of things on my mind. All right. Well, this is a good one. Can you send the VPU video to MA3D? Can you send the VPU video to A? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, in fact, I think we have a bulletin about that. Yeah, we do. All right. Um, it's on the support dashboard. Mm -hmm. oh. CIP, CITP streaming video into MA3D. So in this case, once again, CITP enabled, which enables it globally for the system. You don't have to set up any of this stuff that you see here. And then you select the material, which is a, v is a stream from the VPU software. Cool. Cool. Um, we have questions about the new codec. I know we have um, some bulletins on that as well. Did you want to discuss that at all, since that's new to 3.2? Yeah. Um, our FAQ page actually covers this because we have the HAP codec in 3.2. The HAP codec is just a new codec. It's a better performing codec and you actually get the, if, you, if you're not doing your own transcoding in your own studio, there is a transcoder built in which is called the converter. I, I don't know how deep of a conversation I want to have about the codec here. It's just it's a new codec. You don't need MPEG-2 anymore. You don't need main concepts. Uh, you just use HAP. And HAP is open source, so you actually will find, like, I think I think QuickTime, QuickTime Pro can create HAP files for you for, like, 50 bucks. You buy the $50 converter for QuickTime. You can do it from your Mac. 
Um, there's also a link here for the Windows-based software that exists. I thought there was a link here. I'm forgetting something. There it is. App for Direct Show Codec. Gosh, we need to do something about making those links a little more noticeable. Um, but this is the software you can get as well to create app because remember, VPU hardware is actually designed for real-time rendering, where at, which means you know beefy video card. Content conversion is actually very CPU dependent. So if you build your own computer with a super powerful CPU, you'll actually get content conversion done much faster. You know, dedicated hardware for its specific purposes. I, if people have specific questions about HAP, I'll try to answer it, but it's a great codec. Definitely use it. And it, it explains here the difference between the three, which is what I highlighted, you know. Obviously, if you can get away with HAP1, you should always use HAP1. It just doesn't tax your VPU very much. If you, for some reason, really need a high quality for a super dense, video wall or something, then you can use HAPQ. And then HAP Alpha is really fun because you can put that alpha channel in your video files. Cool. Uh, hey, Will, in network config in the VPU tab, what is the content option of distributor or receiver all about? Uh, this is how you manage the, the content management. So uh, if, you have, if you have multiple VPUs, or you have your front of house VPU over machine, which is what's just a laptop where you put your content on, you will distribute it to the other VPUs using the distributor distribution function. So the my real, this VPU might be the distributor and then these two are receiving it. So I put, I put my content onto the distributor and then I hit content distribution to automatically send that to the receivers over the network. Because you might have a VPU stage left, one stage right, and one upstage, and then one front of house for your overview machine. You don't want to have to go to every VPU to put content on it. Cool. Okay. Since HAP is an open source codec, do you still need the main concept license for the VPU teaser mode? No. It uh, looks like that's about the gist of VPU questions. The rest are uh, MA2 questions. Do you want to get into that, or do you want to call it a webinar? Yeah, we're sort of at the end of our webinar here. All right. Um, I, I don't know what else to say, to say. If you understand the philosophy of the VPU, I think you'll find it's very applicable to many of your shows. But maybe if you're doing really complex 3D mapping, there's other media server companies that do this better. You know, ours is a video processing unit for the Grand MA2 user. Um, and as you see, we make pixel mapping super easy, which is what the lighting guy wants. And if you just want some DVI ports for some screens, we make that very easy. There is a warper in the VPU that you could do complex mapping. There's keystones, bordering, soft edging, all that stuff um, exists in there but now you at least have an overview of how to set it up and then uh, you can start playing with it. Okay. I think it's good. I think it's good as well. Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure, you guys. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Remember, if you're in North America, you can email support.acclighting.com and if you're outside of North America, you can contact your local distributor with any further questions. Happy programming. Happy programming, folks.